everyone, and welcome to the Ladies Tell Podcast, my absolute favorite podcast of the four podcasts to record. Oh, wait, I can't say that. I love all my podcasts equally. <laughs> you see the smile, right? <laughs> sarcasm. It's sarcasm. No, I do. I do. I really do. Hi, I'm Wilona, by the way. Oh, wow. Hi, back to me. I forgot. I remembered to introduce myself. Oh, head roll with the... Yes. I'm sorry my professionalism I actually have like a real professional person in the house today so I need to act like I have since that's not happening one of my friends says since you know when people are cute their sense grows out in their hair you see how long it is it's all down here at the tip split ends too um <laughs> I, what y'all I know y'all know this because you're a regular listener to the, to the podcast. I'm just going to assume it. Regular listener. And they are, and I thought divorce was bad, and I thought being grown up was easy. If only our mere memoir and verse, foreign coffee, widow's web, and widow's deck. And those are six books, but those are the six audio books. Ha ha ha. You thought I only wrote six books. Me, like this? No. I try to over <laughs> Uh, in total is 20 some but we're only going to talk about 17 so you can see the other 11 books on www.andithoughtladies.com did I mention I'm an and I thought lady yes we're called the and I thought ladies there we go I think I finished everything about me which is weird to say because I'm a narcissist no they, they never get finished talking about them the narcissist of the group not a true narcissist god that would be horrible but you're not here to hear about me because not a true narcissist Aha. You're here to hear about our wonderful guests. Wonderful guests, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, my goodness. You're like a one woman Mardi Gras. I will say that for the record. My name is Paige Morrow Kimball, and I'm so happy we got this to work out. I'm so when happy she, to be your guest. When she says that, she really means that because the last time I got food poisoning from something I ate. <laughs> Food poisoning is the worst, you know? Oh, it was yeah. so bad. Granted, I do lose a little weight, oh. a whole one pound. So yes. like every time, right? <laughs> every time I get food poisoning, I'm like, at least it's two pounds gone. Okay, but we're not going down that food rabbit hole, remember? Oh, right. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you are definitely a producer. You keep things on track. <laughs> It's true. It's true. I'm a producer. Chop, chop. You got to be right. Got to be productive. Um, exactly. Nice to be here. Hello. It is a pleasure to have you here. Okay. Sure. First question. I know that like, I said that you should say three things about yourself. Yeah. So, and I saw you write it down. So go ahead. With it. Okay. I'm going to go down my list. I mean, there's so many things, so many feelings, so little time. But uh, first of all, I will say I am a multi-hyphenate in multi-genres of the film and television industry. Um, I am a recent empty nester. I just dropped my youngest daughter off to college, but I'm kind of okay because I have a really nice husband and it's our time. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and then I have the cutest dog ever. That's number three, but it should be number one. You want to see her? She's yes. You can't take cuteness without. I know. Oh my God. She's a rescue. Her name is Finley. Can you oh. say And she doesn't bark. She's not mean and she's not whiny. She's like a big dog in a little dog's body. So. How? Okay. No, what you have is the perfect dog. <laughs> you know, it's true. You are the perfect dog. I love yeah. you. That's it. She's upstaging me. Never work with children or animals. Okay. Oh. I so, think it's great because no one notices like how bad you do because I was like so cute and I'm like right <laughs> mess that up then you didn't even notice because they're so cute um <laughs> I did have I a see. real first question yeah so what else do you want to know okay I think I've mentioned before well no let me before I get started on my real real professional first question let's talk about the things that I need to get out of the way okay so I don't go down the rabbit hole one of the reasons that we started interviewing so many people in LA was because I read when I was 12 years old that there is something where a table where they put all the all the food on it and they uh, keep that for all the hours that it's out there. And I cannot remember the name of it right now, which is so pissing me off. And you know, the table where they oh. put all the snacks. Craft service? Crafty. How do you we not remember crafty? crafty? You're, you're, you're too young to forget things. You're, oh, you're right. like, 
in it. Crafty, everything. Crafty yeah. is everything. Yeah. You got to be careful. You get fat with crafty. And but I'm already fat, so, so it works. Much. They feed you all the time. See, so oh, we're not going down the food rabbit hole. You're trying to get me there. I feel I it. said I was getting it out of the way so I don't okay. do it later. All right. So what's the best craft service table that you've ever had? Um, that I've ever had or I've ever been on set with. Because, you know, the, the episodics, I mean, they have the really good craft. I just, I was just shadowing um, a director named Todd Holland um, on So Help Me Todd on CBS. They had, and it was up in Vancouver. <sighs> Those Canadians really know how to serve it up. They had a great craft service table. They even had like chia seed pudding in the mornings and like, you know, things like if you want to avoid carbs, which I try to, you can just find your thing. You know, these little egg cups. I mean, they, I, I love the craft service on So Help Me Time. So yes. Unfortunately, this show got canceled. Yeah, that's sad. It happens. Yeah, what? the show got canceled. After I think it was the third season, yeah. Yeah, this is the third yeah. season. Yeah, and then uh, I also like the neighborhood. It's a multicam show, is and it was really, really good, crafty. But I can't tell you what I had. I just remember it being good. It stood out in my mind. I spent a lot of time in that. Little craft <laughs> yeah. I love hearing about crafty. That's like my <laughs> favorite thing to do. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about real business. I'm sorry. Okay. I told you. I'm trying to. Be, I'm trying sorry. to be as professional as you. Be sorry. Uh, the next thing is. Now I'm thinking about that crafty. I'm sorry. The next no, thing is like, oh, you was one of the, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to be sorry. Women apologize too much. Don't we, we got to stop, got to recognize and just say, you know, like find another thing to say, not I'm sorry, but let me try to do better. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how you knew that. I have been working on that for the last yeah. two weeks. Good for you. I love yeah. it. Take charge, be confident. I'm going to need that skill. Yeah, and we're working so, on this all the time, you know? Right? So that's, yep. For sure. Right. Real question. Okay, let's You're do one it. of the few producers I know that have jumped from documentary into scripted. How on earth did you do it? Okay, I could give you the map right now. So as you said, started in documentary. Um, I did a lot of, um, you know, reality shows uh, after documentary. I did... First, I started in like daytime television, you know, like the home shows kind of thing. And I worked for Oprah, which I loved. I was her interview producer out here in Los Angeles. I came from New York. So I started on daytime in New York, moved out here, worked for Oprah freelance um, out here, meaning L.A. Um, and then I started reality shows after documentaries. I did uh, in the middle, I did uh, sports documentaries. I worked on the Olympics, which was so great for an independent documentary filmmaker named Bud Greenspan. He did a lot of the independent um, Olympic films, like the official Olympic films. And that was so great. Um, came out to Los Angeles, started working for Oprah Freelance, did a couple of TV shows and then I did Project Greenlight, which was a great, that was a great show to work on. Um, and then that morphed into narrative filmmaking scripted because I just made a short film. You know, I had my babies, I had risen, I climbed the ladder in reality television to supervising producer. And it's like the hours were so crazy that I just decided when I became a mom that I wanted to spend actually time with my kids and actually see them grow up, you know, it's a crazy concept, but that's what I did. So I took a step back out of reality, which was six hour, six days a week, like 19 hour days. It was nuts, but it's what you had to do, right? So took a step back and I started acting at that time, which was always a passion. And then I realized I got to create content for myself to be in. So that's when I started down the narrative path and I made a couple of films. Um, I started with a really small one, like, you know, shot it with a few friends. It was called Slipped and it was so, um, sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, it was, it was uh, short and sweet, but it kind of, I got the bug. And then I made, you can see on the back, I made this one next, ending up, it was a divorce comedy. I gave myself a little cameo, but at that time I was so intrigued with just directing narrative and I wanted to focus 
that um, I just I just did that. I was the director, producer, writer, and then I had a little cameo in it. Um, but ending up did really well. And then based on the success of that, going to all the film fests, let me make this little beauty called Play Date. This really became like a social impact film, and it still wins awards. Um, and this one I was not in. I have a tiny part in the beginning where you know I just needed a lady in the playground. I was a lady in the playground, um, but I gotta say. Making that film opened so many doors for me. So that's how you do it. To answer your question, you can do it. You know, you surround yourself with people who are just talented and know a lot. You write yourself a script. You either put yourself in it or you direct it and you practice, practice, practice. And then you just put it out there. I mean, you know, we're storytellers. And I think that you just got to know your sort of what your um, special sauce is you know I know mine is to uplift and inspire and so I just kind of came with but up with these ideas and the first film slipped was a really simple film oh no I made one before that oh my god I'm knocked up it was a comedy really really simple finding my way slipped really really simple finding my way ending up a little more sophisticated for main actresses the whole thing and then play date was the one that kind of got me into the studio programs um, and just sort of started the forward momentum, you know? Does nice. that answer your question in a really long-winded answer? Yeah, the more details there are, the better yeah. it is. Yeah. People want to learn. And I know I want to learn. And and thank right. you so much for that. Right. Just being able to start off simple. This gives me a question that is completely on the other side of the of the spectrum. Sure. But I'm not sure I want to jump there yet. So I'm going to jump here first. Okay. Uh, a divorce comedy film. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with that? So interesting. Um, no, I mean, I was, I've was i been married for now probably 24 years, I think it is. 23 years now. Married 23 years. So I just would like, you know, sort of fantasize, what if we got divorced? Because our lives became so meshed, you know? At that time, probably we had been married about 13 years. That was the year my parents got divorced. So I started thinking, well, we're good, but what if? Like, how would I we separate all of our, you know, CDs and our record albums at the time it was CDs? Um, but how would we kind of like, separate our lives and what would that be like and it just kind of like popped in a lot of times I ask a question you know with an idea like what if this happened and then you go down this path and you know what I find really helpful is deadline because deadlines as not in the publication deadline but having a deadline so I knew I wanted to apply to the um, uh, women's, um, what is it, uh, at AFI, the DWW. So the DWW um, is a contest, really, and you send them a short, and if you get picked, you get to make it. So I applied, and I wanted to apply. So I wrote this on deadline, and this was my idea. It's a divorce comedy, and I did not get in. And this was positive fuel. That's the other thing. Just put it out there. You're going to get rejected, rejected, rejected. And then guess what? They were probably really bummed that they didn't take me because this film did really well. And then I applied again with Playdate. Guess what? Got an interview, did not get in. And they were really bummed because that film did really, really, really well. But what I'm saying is if I give myself um, this deadline and this contest and I just put it in see what happens it it motivates you you know and positive fuel from rejection is the best thing you could possibly do I was like oh yeah you're not going to take me I'm going to make my film anyway and guess what it's going to be really good and then you rewrite and rewrite and rewrite you know well no no because you know writing is rewriting but you never let anyone stop you and a very smart boss once taught me you never take a no from someone who can't give you a yes that is key you just keep going uh, it's about resilience yeah i think i absolutely love that idea 
Never mm-hmm. take a no from someone who can't give you the yes. Because you can't, if you don't have the power to say yes, then you should sure don't have the power I, to say no. For I real. All the time. Like you can get a no from the person that answers you the phone, the phone, let's say. But is that the person that you're really needing the yes from? Mm-mm. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing. You have given me, yeah. You've given me a new mantra. Thank right. you for that. Anytime. Okay. So yeah. now we're jumping to the other side of the spectrum. Okay. Uh, you kept saying about these films and then there were four main actresses and you got sophisticated which means yeah. financing how the yeah. hell did you find financing at, at first crowdfunding um, I did I kick started ending up we raised I think it was I mean only like eight thousand dollars you know we were so afraid of it but my producer and I went for it and we just sent we built the the page the kickstart page and the thing is about crowdfunding um you know it's like you meet somebody else like when one person has an idea it's one thing but the minute you get that partner you double it so then you have two communities and that's the way i've always built it always crowdfunded always raised money for my project is is you know inviting other people into the idea and have them be collaborators. And it's amazing how that grows exponentially, your efforts. So with ending up, we crowdfunded, and then this one, Playdate, we crowdfunded $13,000. And so it grew, you know, I just kept expanding my followers. Always keep your email lists, have a newsletter if you can, like get your MailChimp set up and just collect email addresses. And mine is now in the thousands. So direct email is really powerful. Social media is one thing, but direct email marketing is everything, in my opinion, or in-person parties, cocktail parties, fundraiser kind of things. But, you know, start small. Don't overwhelm yourself because if you get too far ahead of yourself, it stops you. But if you take digestible bites, I, I really think you just start growing one thing at a time. The power of networking, because I heard you say cocktail parties and things like that. People ask me all the time, how do you know that person? And I'm just like, networking. <laughs> how how important is this? Because I keep telling authors, you got to get out here, especially ones who want movie adaptations or they want to shoot their own. Like, you got to get out here. How important is it to network in the proper crowd? I think it's it's hugely important. It's It's one piece of the puzzle but it's definitely a piece of it. You know, one of my mentors is Todd Holland. He's the one I shadowed on So Help Me Todd and CBS. He is a master director and a great human. And uh, he he has this formula that I'd love to share because I think it's really important. Um, and the first piece is practice your craft, which we just talked about, right? Grab your iPhone, make your little, you know, a thousand dollar movie, then you grow, you keep practicing your craft. Then you, the second piece is network, okay? And that's a very big piece. And I'll tell you more about how I network. The third thing is protect your joy, okay? These films you see behind me, the things I do, I love. They're important to me, they're meaningful. So I'm always protecting my joy, not only in my work, but outside. Like what are the things you love to do, right? And the last step, most important, repeat. Because this ain't easy. And it takes that formula over and over. So practice your craft, network, protect your joy, and repeat. And you keep doing that. And it's just time. It builds. Um, Specifically with networking, um, I think you have to join. The the best thing you can do is join a group. Like um, I joined Filmmakers. It's in Los Angeles. Started out in New York. It's in Los Angeles. And it's such a supportive, wonderful group. I'm also part of Film Fatals. You know, there's women in film in every single city. There's Alliance of Women Directors in LA. All of these resources are there to support and they have meetups. And then you connect with people and you network and you never know who you're gonna meet at these things. And then you have professional affiliations. If you're a member of SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, which I am. I'm a member of the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, and I go to events and I network in those circles. You just start meeting people. I mean, that's how I met Todd Holland at at some DGA events. And you you just keep that networking going. The, the, The best thing you can do for networking is actually keep a spreadsheet, or if you're not a spreadsheet person, a list 
I met this person on this date in this place. This is the last time I reached out. And then you keep an eye out for these people and you, you look in the trades, like let's say you read deadline, you know, and you see, oh, this person just got a new show. Let me just send them an email. Nothing about myself, no ask. You just say, congratulations. I just think it's great. You follow them on social media and you make comments. So they get used to seeing your name. They get used to who you are. You always uplift. You're always joyful. They say it takes seven touches. And then hopefully you go to an event in person and you get lucky and you ride down in an elevator with that person. Or you go to a film festival and there happen to be, they happen to be a panelist at the film festival you're at. So all these touches build your circle of networking and you just keep doing what you're doing. And you, my dear Monona, are a master networker. I've, I've watched some of your uh, interviews. You have networked with a lot of people on these and I, I give you tremendous kudos because it's, it's not easy, it's time spent and I'm sure you have your master spreadsheet or your list and you keep in touch with these people. And if you don't, you're going to start that today. <laughs> As I said, I am learning so much. <laughs> yeah. If I can't remember crafty, because everything, everybody I met is in my head. I'm like, I just remember really? everyone and how I met them and where I met them. I would and do, put it in, you start a simple spreadsheet. Just start keeping track. I met this person. I interviewed them on this date. And then when you see and maybe something that stood out to you about them, you know, like a lot of times I, when I go into a general meeting, you know, we have these things in this town called general meetings. You meet with a, you know, executive network executive, you meet with showrunners or, or whoever it is, but you go and it's really good to research them before. So maybe you keep a list, right? You keep your spreadsheet, you put in, you know, I met Paige Morrow Kimball on this place or this you know I interviewed her and these are some things about her that great resources Facebook like you can tell from my Facebook or my Instagram I'm a parent oh I'm a parent you draw things that you have in common or you know I'm, she's from New York I'm from New York oh she lives in LA now you know like anything or she worked on this show and I have a friend who worked in this show you just kind of put down little hits that you get from people you know she has a dog I love dogs. You know, it's whatever it is that you have in common. It's a really great tool. And then you remember, you know, and then you can congratulate them and remind them how you met or, you know, remind them a little something that you admire about them or something you have in common. And it, that's how you build relationships and network. Nice. Thank you so much. for. Okay. Yeah. Anyone who's listening to this particular podcast, you need to rewind, listen to it again, because this information <laughs> just amazing she has been so helpful i have two questions because we are running out of time really fast okay do it. and those questions number one mm -hmm. is how did you go from behind the camera to in front of the camera? because everyone goes from in front to behind or they go i want to be behind but you did it the other way around yeah well i always had a love of performing like coming up in high school and i i loved performing i thought that's what i was going to do and then once i got behind the camera i just fell in love with filmmaking but um, it really came when my kids were born and I felt like I didn't have the hours to put into that producing path. So I started acting um, because it was less time consuming at the time. And then I started doing commercials. So it really came late for me. It came in my thirties. I was already in my mid thirties. And I have to say, like, there's nothing wrong. It's never too late. And I mean, and now my acting career is really gaining momentum. And it's like, I, I do both now. And I think you just throw yourself in. You find a great teacher. That's another group, right? Community. I found a great teacher named Stuart K. Robinson. He was a commercial teacher. Now he has an agency. Um, and then this group of people that would take his class became my acting community. And I just learned. I just started practicing and going out on auditions and getting auditions. And I don't know, it just grows. Oh, wow. Yeah, be brave. <laughs> a whole different skill set though like that. I love it but but you have to understand that acting directing writing producing it all feeds each other because in order to be a great director you have to understand actors in order to be a great actor you have to understand writers and directors you know and and producers is kind of the whole thing it's I call it a 360 degree view of this industry you know that I've had and I've done every job from craft service to PAing to producing, to DPing, to editing, all of it. 
And that all becomes part of your skill set. So I say practice, you know, my, I'll just say this, my last film that I made was a documentary. I went back to documentary powers and that I shot with this over the pandemic, all female crew of one with my iPhone. I had a really great mic. You got to get the mic, plug it in. They have lenses and stuff you can experiment with, but I made that film by myself, learned how to edit, and that film was arguably my most successful film to date. It went all over the world to festivals. It won 12 awards and it's, you know, got distribution. So um, that film was, is really special to me because I, I didn't, it just sort of was born and I just went for it. So I, I really think having all the perspectives, being a multi-hyphenate, it's a good thing now. You know, you don't have to choose one. Practice your craft in all different ways. That's what Absolutely. I think. Yeah. I love that about now because like you, you can, if you get a base in one area and, and it makes an income, you can yeah. then go to other areas and be like, do I like this? No. Okay. Do I like this? A little I mean, bit. Okay. You you need need income, right. Uh-huh. You need the income, you need the bread and butter, and then you can dabble in your other things and build those things. You know, it's about time. Time's yes. big, pretty, I think. Because yeah. there were so many gatekeepers. Wait, that's a whole other discussion. From <laughs> <laughs> what was the other about? question? Did you have one more? And so the last question is, um, no, come on, Brain, not not again. You know it. Oh, but I know it is. I know what it is. Oh, I knew it. So the last question is, what's coming up next for you? And where can people find out more information? You see, look at that. There was the cookie cutter question. That's the one I messed up on. I know, right? Um, Let's see. What is coming up next? Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited because I have a feature film called The So Long Summer. That's a coming of age um, story about a mother and daughter in 1970s. And it's very personal. It's based on my mother. Um, and it's a beautiful film and we're gaining some momentum. So hopefully we'll be shooting that this year. Um, the other thing I'm doing is another documentary. See, that's scripted, okay? And then I'm doing another documentary where I'm following this wonderful couple. It's called, they're Sherry and Gonzalo are their names and they're in their eighties and they're artists and they built this beautiful home together with all of their art called the Venice Mosaic Tile House. And it's following them through their lives together and they're aging and they're creating art. They have no kids, no one to leave their house to. So they're figuring out what to do next. So they're planning their futures at this point in their lives. And it's a beautiful love story. It's called Sherry and Gonzalo are in love. Um, I've done, uh, just did two more Sesame Street films. I've done many films for Sesame Street. It's been wonderful. Um, And I support up and coming directors by giving them opportunities on those films, directors and art directors and production design and all of those things, all different kinds of people, DPs. And I use those to spread the love and pay it forward. Um, Just got done with one called E is for Exploring that an up and coming director named Radha Mehta um, directed and I produced. Um, And uh, I found her through a, a program through my production company called Macazan Films Directors Program. So if you want to check that out for future opportunities, um, it's macazanfilms.com. And that is spelled M-A-K-A-Z-A-N, films with an S, Macazan Films. Um, and you can find me on Instagram, Paige Morrow Kimball, um, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I'm all over. So check it out, sign up for my newsletter, and you can um, find out opportunities and let's do some work let's create some magic oh my goodness yeah. so everyone out there that is filmmakers that listen to this podcast because uh you know it's interesting that more filmmakers are listening to this podcast now than there are writers and, and this was developed okay. so writers could learn how to do films <laughs> Not for y'all. You've, just... you've had some really interesting industry guests I've been, I told you, I was very impressed with who you had. I thought, is it Carol Kirshner? Is that her last name? I saw her. Um, and then you had Marta, uh, what was her Kaufman. name for friends? What's her last name? Kaufman. She's amazing. Kaufman. I Did saw her. Know? I mean, I was like, wow, you got some good people. Lori so, McCreary. Yes. Entertainment. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. Amazing group. But I think writing and filmmaking, it goes hand in hand because we're all storytellers at the end of the day. It's like, we can't help who we are. That's how you know. You know, that's how you know you love it because it's like, you can't do anything else. 
you know we were shaman back in the day this was our this was our purpose and i think that it can take all forms you can write a novel you can write a screenplay you just have to practice the craft find out learn from people you know practice your craft and um and just follow your heart as much as you can you know yeah. thank you so much for those ending words i love that idea follow your heart and i'm going to yeah. actually something i never do here and that is uh a seg we're going to do a segment transition right here just just no notice, notice this follow your heart and if your heart decides to take you to www.andithoughtladies.com did you notice that one yeah <laughs> very smooth <laughs> you can go down to the middle of the page and you can see the charities that we proudly support we ask that you take the time out to support them as well this does not mean money it means that you could just give them some uh, resources <laughs> that could be your energy or some knowledge because hey once or twice we've had guests on and they're like oh I needed to know that so definitely think about doing that we thank you in advance for that remember that wisdom is all around you if you're opening to find it and accepting it so peace and love you guys from Winona and before I talk about the missing Jade I just want to say I love this guest because she worked on one of my favorite television shows the green light project and the miss and also from the missing Jade oh bye-bye you guys and oh yeah thanks for listening